All right, welcome to another episode of Raise Them Up, a podcast for parents who want to raise their kids in the faith. And I'm pretty excited to get the conversation going about Sticky Faith by Dr. Kara Powell and Dr. Chap Clark. It was kind of the original book, so to speak, that kind of took the the the, the raising kids in the faith conversation up to the next level uh, in 2011 uh, was when this was written. And I think that's important for us to kind of note from the very beginning, and I'm sure that we're going to get into that. But our first chapter uh, of this great book is called The Not-So-Sticky Faith Reality. All right. So welcome you guys as well to this conversation. Uh, Let's go ahead and just dive on in. What is the not-so-sticky faith reality that this first chapter talked about? We are up against it as parents. I think that's one thing that stuck out to me. There's there's so many statistics and research that the, the authors of this book and their teams uh, brought to the table that were alarming, and rightfully so, about the nature of, of kids and their, their walk, or the fact that all adolescents tend to go through a rebellious phase, um, but what that's doing in our current culture um, and in our churches, and how... Um, it, it seems as though we're not doing enough or that the things that we're trying are maybe not working. So that was a big piece for me that stuck out that there's a lot, uh, a lot to be concerned about that we can't just have the, oh, they'll turn out all right mentality. We have to be much more active than that. Sure. I like that. And one of the words I appreciated too is intentionality. Mm-hmm. So being intentional with things. And so I like too that you brought up, and this is going to be true anytime we engage with something from Fuller Youth Institute, uh, which is the organization that, well, this actually Actually, this book launched Fuller Youth Institute. It was one of the first research projects that really came together for them, uh, a product of Fuller Seminary uh, that's here in Houston, but the Fuller Youth Institute now over in California. Uh, and they do, they, they take a lot of research. And then what they do is they turn it into resources mm-hmm. uh, for people that are walking alongside of kids and students and young adults, uh, people that are uh, parents or in ministry or families, the same thing we talked about in our, our pilot episode about the same people we want to engage with too. Okay, so good. There's lots of challenges facing us, and we all have different postures towards those challenges. Uh, so as you hear that, Keith and Jan, like what what is sticking out to you when you look at this chapter and what you're seeing and what you're hearing about those challenges? Yeah, I think acknowledging that my kids growing, I have one in middle school, in eighth grade, I have one who's a junior in high school, the things they're seeing, the things they're experiencing are very different from the things that I saw and experienced at those same times. And I have to remember, it was a challenge for me Mm -hmm. trying to find my identity and develop my own personal identity, you know, and be separate from my parents, right? Because for a long time, you just are who your parents say you are. And my girls are trying to figure out who they are for themselves. And they have a lot of things in society. You've got social media, you've got friends, um, And to be honest, my girls were sheltered for a long time, and now they've kind of come out of the shelter and are, like, experiencing all this new stuff. And it's uh, there's a lot of acknowledging for me that things are different, and parenting is going to have to be different, and um, walking and guiding them is going to have to be different. Um, I acknowledged in our first episode— I feel like I was a great young kid mom, but man, this teenage stuff is not easy. It's not easy for the girls and it's certainly not easy for me. Yeah. And I hear that. And I think too, like thinking about when this book was written, actually, as I was reading it this time, this is my second time through this part of the book. And uh, it it dawned on me, this research is about me. Mm. Uh, I graduated college in 2011. And so this is all research of of my generation that's gone through and things like that. And I I think of how different it is since I went through. But Keith, you have people that are my age too. So when you think about these challenges and you you recognize that your your kids were going through a lot of the things, what stands out to you and the the challenges that kids are facing these days? Well, I think it's really a challenge with the parents, too. It's There is no formula. This book mm-hmm. isn't a, a, oh, gee, I read it and everything will be fixed. I mean, it's a resource, and everybody's different. The thing I've liked about the book is its humbleness that everyone faces a struggle. I think one of the things you look at is, you know, are my kids a reflection of me or do they reflect God? And mm. too often we get centered on, I want my kid to be, you know, be my shining light and see how great I raised them. What that's to me is a little bit off kilter. It's how do they reflect God's love and 
you know, God works in different ways, and it's not the path that we choose. We cannot write our kids' script. Mm -hmm. We like to. We want to. There's a lot of terms out there for parents who who do that, lawnmower parents, helicopter (laughs) parents. But the bottom line is they don't get to write the script. But I like the way that this book approaches it very bluntly and very with, with a certain amount of humbleness. And I think that's how you have to read it. You have to say, you know, I'm not perfect. I didn't do things perfectly. I know I certainly didn't. Um, you can get my kids on here if you want to hear about all that. But, I mean, there's things, you know, there's things I learned from my parents and things I had to alter because they grew up in a different time. I had depression parents who grew up during the Great Depression, so their whole walk on life was a lot different. Me growing up in the 60s and 70s with Vietnam and things like that, that influenced me. And then my kids grew up during you know, 9-11 mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Iraqi war and those kind of things. And, and now you know, with COVID and the pandemic and mm-hmm. other things out there that are, that are threatening, it, it's, it's a, they're all the same, but they're all different. And, oh, yeah. and, and it's just kind of the way to look at it. So No, I think it's good for us to hear. I appreciate it by the end of the chapter where they did say that phrase, there's no silver bullet to parenting. Mm-hmm. And I think, Keith, I really appreciate your comments too, because there's that, I, well, I'm reminded of a, a summer of camp. My second summer as director of camp and some of the parents thought I was crazy because the theme that I chose uh, for that summer, we called it Lose Control, right? Mm-hmm. So you can imagine, Keith, right. that you made Lose Control <laughs> the theme of Trinity Klein Lutheran School. That's called uh, the Sugar Shack on yeah, Friday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And But what it was, was it was a conversation about things we need to lose and recognize are in the hands of God, right? Yeah. Control is in God's hands and God's hands alone. It's not in our hands as church workers. It's not in the hands of parents, unfortunately. Now, there are things that are... I actually had a great moment recently. Uh, it was with our elementary school principal and a student that was struggling with anxiety. And uh, I, I, I like to always ask, like, have you had experience in talking with someone that helped, you know, before? And they said, yes. I said, oh, tell me about that. How did it go? What helped? And, and this student told me that uh, the, the counselor that they had been seeing, the therapist, had said, uh, hold out their hand. All right, and let's place things into our hands that we can control Mm -hmm. and then recognize the things that are outside of our hand, right? And I think they even had a paper where they drew that on there. But that's important for our parents to recognize too as we walk through this conversation. What am I in control of and what am I not in control of? And I think that's gonna be a really important posture as we kind of walk through. And and we've mentioned challenges, we've mentioned social media, we've mentioned uh, pandemic, different things like that. But let's get into the really big three challenges that this chapter points it out of sex, drugs, and alcohol, right? Three words that are always terrifying to say from the pulpit <laughs> uh, or, for, or for people to hear from the pulpit. I don't know if they're always terrifying to say, um, but that was a really big piece. And this is specifically talking about those, those that are walking through the book or not walking through the book with us. That transition from high school to college is really what they studied here. The, the kids that were active in youth group What did it look like in college? What were some of the things that we saw? So as you think about either it's sex, drugs, and alcohol, or the walking away from the church, let's let's address both of those. What are some of those stats that we saw that stood out to you? One that stood out to me was just the the fact that students felt as though their only connection point was through sex, drugs, and alcohol. Like they felt so isolated or so separated from community, so inept at being able to build relationships with others that their go-to had to be something like a party scene. Um, and then to, to play that out, it ended up, there was a, a quote on page 18 that says, every single emergency room in every single hospital adjoining or near a college campus stocks extra extra supplies on Thursday nights, which is Thirsty Thursday, Um, rape kits for sexual assault victims, IV fluids for those who are dehydrated from alcohol-induced vomiting, and blood for drunk driving accidents. And while I know that some of those challenges may have shifted or changed a little bit in the last 10 years, um, just the fact that that students are willing to risk so much um, knowingly or just kind of the ignorance is bliss uh, because they're so desperate for relationships, that really struck me. Absolutely. I mean, and that's, it's that social connection is what they really want. But the one way to do that is through alcohol. And I thought it was really interesting how the book pointed out in their research too, that, that, and it's, again, this is not, I mean, I I mean, I would imagine every single one of us, I don't think I've had a drink with every single one of us here, but I know that we all, we all do, right. Or we all have. And so it's not that we're saying alcohol is bad, but certainly what alcohol can do in the life of someone uh, is, is, is important for us to address here. And what was crazy to me was how alcohol was someone at the 
center of the other issues. Uh, mm-hmm. And they didn't really go into drugs, which I imagine, especially as we think about that 10 year gap, yeah. that is a new, newer reality. I mean, certainly it goes back 50, 60 years and even further. So as long, as long as drugs have existed, but the intensity in the last 10 years, especially with opioids or the new mm-hmm. introduction of vaping and things like that gets added into it. And again, all of those are seen as social uh, opportunities, but particularly with sex, that was one of the, the standouts. They use the term hookups, which mm-hmm. can refer to a whole lot of different things. If your kid ever asks you or says that this talks about hooking up, make sure you ask, what does that mean? Because every single one of them will have a different yep. decision or <laughs> definition. definition. Yeah. But here it talked about how in hooking up, uh, the, the researchers on the medical side, and I can't remember what hospital it was or what college it was that did the research, 100%. Yep. As as close to as 100% as could be possible were had, they called it lubri- lubricated with alcohol. So alcohol led to sexual encounters and experiences. And that was one that stood out to me too, because especially from, from my seat of walking through that conversation with students about what is sex mm-hmm. and what are the outcomes of sex, what's God's design for sex, uh, how that can, when you break God's design, when you step outside of that design, if you're not married to the person, it can cause other other things in your life psychologically the way your body was designed and things like that now i i was gonna speaking the, the book is addressing sex and issues with alcohol and sex but i think 10 years ago i think today one of the bigger issues is not sex the physical act but mm-hmm. sex the what is your gender kind of thing i think that's a whole new conversation that has entered for our kids that is creating this whole new dynamic for those kiddos, even those that have grown up in church that are that have been taught, you know, man and woman and those kinds of things. I think we've got this whole new dynamic joining in and muddying the waters more. Exactly. And, it, and it's in the conversation, right? So that's yeah. the thing is now the conversation is happening earlier and earlier and earlier. And I say earlier and earlier and earlier. I remember fall of 2014, I was on my vicarage in Green Bay and one of the kindergarten teachers was talking to me, five-year-olds talking about like, what does it mean like that he likes him? Are they gay? Oh, wow. You know, and so even at five years old, the, the conversation was being introduced. So you can imagine the same thing uh, with transgenderism or uh, bisexualism and things like that, all becoming a really normal part of the conversation that's happening on YouTube or TikTok or something like that. And so, so this is an important conversation when it comes to faith. How does faith speak into that? conversation. And I think one of the other things, just to paint the picture from the book about sex, uh, they said that the average of college students that they talked to uh, was seven hookups over their four years of of college and uh, 28% of them having 10 or more hookups a year. So it was one of those that was prevalent, but then alcohol too. Some of those stats stood out to me too. One of the biggest ones uh, was about the cost, the amount of money that college students spend on alcohol. And there, the stat quote, it was $5.5 billion uh, from college students on alcohol uh, in a wow. given year, which they pointed out was more than how much they spent collectively on soda, tea, milk, juice, coffee, and books. And y'all, <laughs> just so you know, when I when I first read through this, uh, I, I actually tested the waters. I asked some college students that that I knew would give me a direct answer. And I said, "Do you think that's true? Do 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 people your age, do college students, spend more money on uh, alcohol than books?" And they said. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I was like, it wasn't even a hesitation. Yeah. It wasn't even trying to hide it, but this social piece came out too. And in the, in the conversation, uh, let's, let's keep going though. Right. We talked about the challenges, but, but really and truly the, 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 the foundation of this chapter was what they started out with calling the epidemic of young people leaving the evangelical church. Uh, So the the stats kind of quoted, there were 40 to 50% of kids uh, who are connected to a church or a youth group. Okay. And that's a, that's a key word connected. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not just talking in general about who's on the roster and things like that. It's about, they were involved in youth group. They were involved in church, 40 to 50% graduate from it and fail to stick with it in college. 40 to 50 percent. And then some additional stats that we saw in there, 20 percent of those plan to leave. So they know, like they kind of know that they're going to walk away from the faith in college. They don't really think differently. But then there was also the hopeful, right? About 30 to 60 percent of that 40 to 50 percent will return when they start raising kids and and in their late 20s and things like that. But what kind of stands out to you in that conversation that you saw happening in the book? 
Well, my biggest thing, I guess, looking at it was, you know, it's who you surround yourself with. And when you get away to college, if you surround yourself with people that aren't going to church, you're not going to go to church. I mean, you know, I went to Lutheran church and we were all, you know, we all like, did you go to church? And yeah, I went to St. Mattress with Pastor Pillow and <laughs> we recited mattress, you know, instead of Matins, it was mattress yeah. and stuff. But but there was a uh, an accountability with each other that you're going to church and you're doing this. I think if church isn't part of your daily life, if that's something that you don't seek out and you don't have anybody holding you accountable to it, it's not going to, not going to be as prevalent that way. And, um, you know, I can just see that happening more and more because there's a lot more things to do. There's a lot more distractions. There's a lot more, you know, even with online church, you know, I can make, it sounds like it makes it easier, but do you make it part of your ritual? Is mm-hmm. it something that you religiously do? Or you go, well, I can do that anytime. And if you can do that anytime, that often leads to no, no time. time, never. So, so it's just kind of one of those things that we've made it easier but have we made it easier to a- access or have we made it easier to dodge? Mm-hmm. Because that has to be purposeful. Absolutely. And I think and I think this is a really good transition into the, the sticky faith definition because that kind of third point really hammers in at what you were talking about. Because uh, in, the, in the book, they just define it in three ways. And I love how they kind of partner things in each one of them. So number one is uh, sticky faith is both internal and that's about your internal thoughts, uh, so the faith that lives in you as you're going about your day, uh, and then also external in your choices and your actions. So faith is something that is both internal and something that is lived out uh, external. Number two is both personal, like I have my personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and communal. Okay, so I think that connects Keith with mm-hmm. what you're saying too. Of okay, you're, you're, you've got this ritual, but are you actually doing it personally? right? Are you actually carrying it out? But then also there's this communal aspect of, of being shared with somebody too. And again, I think that's a wonderful conversation for us to have at some point uh, along our journey here. But number three, I think is really uh, critical to what you were talking about was, was sticky faith is also mature and maturing. And I loved how they pointed out this was particularly true for college students, especially because if they walk in with a mature faith, it can't stop. It has to keep maturing. It has to keep growing because that's the journey of faith for all of us is that it's all, um, it's, it's always moving. It's always growing and until the day that Jesus calls us home or he returns. That's, that's our reality for us too. So as you think about that sticky faith reality, as you, as you listen to kind of what Keith was saying too, what, what, what stands out to you guys? Well, I, I think that the book addressed, you know, kind of the communal aspect that what can we as church members do? What can we um, as parents, but then as parents, not parenting alone on an island, but together with our friends and our, uh, you know, other family members, um, it, it, we can't be haphazard. And that was the word that the book used. They said, it's surprising how churches desire youth to have this sticky faith and to maintain it and to return to the church. Um, and yet they approach it so haphazardly. Um, so just mm. the fact that we need to come together as a community so that our kids will come together as a community and maintain that community. Um, I think that was a really, a really important point. Absolutely. And I, I was reminded of a quote from the forward. So mm. page 10 of, of the book, it says, kids experience Jesus Christ when adults in the church give them grace, time, and genuine love with no hidden agenda. Mm. I thought that was so powerful. So it's, again, not the haphazard, but very intentionally just caring about students. Again, no agenda, Yep. Uh, no, any, nothing but just grace, time, and genuine love for all students. And that's not just, and that's certainly true for parents, and I'm right. sure we'll get to that, but it's also true for all of us. Like, do you know people who are walking through this season of life in particular? Uh, and I think we can honestly go from like all ages. I mean, they they need it when they're (laughs) kids. They need it when they're junior high. They need it when they're high school. They need it when they're college. They need it when they're in their young adult years. And they they need it from kids. They need it from, you know, other other teens. They need it from young adults. It's so hard to teach that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the harsh reality is you're always going to have problems and the problems just change. I mean, the problems of of a parent are different than a problem in a, for, for a college age student. But they're always going to be that way, and if you get Jesus out of your life, it's they're just more difficult. And and mm-hmm. using Him in in a way that is right and salutary is is the way to go. And mm-hmm. you know, too often we we look at Jesus like Cain did and say, "Hey, I gave an offering, and God God didn't give me blessings. He gave it to Abel, who didn't expect anything in return." 
And when kids do that, or adults do that, right. they, they well, God doesn't answer prayers. Well, you know, we all know he does and doesn't always say yes, and he's not a genie that we rub a lamp <laughs> on, and, and poof, we get what we want. So I, I, I said this in class the other day. Uh, show me the verse in the Bible that says life is easy. Mm-hmm. Right. I can't find it. I mean, it's not in there. I mean, he, you're going to struggle. You're going to have problems. Exactly. It's how you are equipped to do it and what you put in your, your toolkit in order to deal with these problems is, is where your success for, for Christ is going to come through. Probably one of the biggest quotes of Scripture I've given this year is, in this world you will have suffering, but take heart, mm-hmm. for I have overcome the world. So I totally see that. Right. Yeah, and I think as a church and as parents and um, teachers and mentors, we've got to remember that those kiddos that are that need the grace the most are those that are going to be hardest to give it to. Mm-hmm. I think that's really challenging sometimes so is true. remembering that, okay, that's the kid that really needs grace the most right now. Are you bringing up your teaching career loved. here, Jan, <laughs> when you were a teacher? How, no, I'm thinking of parenting. You, oh, okay, oh, but parenting. yes, I need lots of grace, y'all. <laughs> but I love, I love how you just expanded our picture today, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you talked about kids that are involved with your kid in theater, kids that are involved with your kid on the soccer field or the sports field, or kids that are involved in your kid in youth group, you know, kids that are coming over to your house or kids that your kid is going over to the house of. Like this is this is our lives. This is encircling of everything that we do. And, and the reality that every one of us has a different story. Some of us are very good at hiding it. And every single one of us needs love that only Jesus can offer in that design form. Now, I know our conversation has been somewhat like doom and gloom so far <laughs> of the reality. But I did, at least for the main takeaway, right? For, for I, know, I know I saw this, I was talking with you guys beforehand, we all saw this. I think the main takeaway gives us a whole lot of hope. So mm-hmm. I definitely wanna give us some time uh, to look into that. And, and the main takeaway was this, in the research that uh, Dr. Powell and Dr. Clark did, they found, they surveyed, actually. That was the really cool part, too. They just asked students. They had five categories that included friends here, friends there, mentors, coaches, teachers, parents. And they said, where do you find your number one support? And the result was overwhelming. And the answer was? Parents. Parents. Parents, parents were the number one place to find support. And, and I know, because I have to constantly speak this grace into parents' <laughs> lives, I know it doesn't feel that way but you really truly are the number one support for your kids. And, and they are looking to you and they are listening to you, even if they are being uh, honorary about it and stubborn about it, they are listening to you and they are learning from you. And I loved how this, this chapter really got into it about really the most influential piece of a student's life is how their parents teach and model, right? So what does your faith look like as you live it out, that is the biggest thing. And I'll, I'll throw grandparents into this mix too, because this has certainly been true. It's certainly true for my life, mm-hmm. um, but it's certainly true in the students' lives that I've seen. Uh, grandparents aren't out of the picture. Like your faith being modeled for your grandkids, they will remember. They will remember your funeral. They will especially ask questions about God at that time too. And what did you think about God? What was your relationship with God? And things like that. And I love it when I hear about grandparents who make the time every other week, whoop, the book fell on the table there. <laughs> uh, the, every other week to do a devotion uh, with their with their families or just something to talk about Jesus or to bring God into the conversation. That is so impactful. But as you guys think about this parent piece, uh, especially being parents, you, see, you get to speak to it from a chair. I can't because I go, this makes total sense to me. This makes total sense to me because that's exactly how God designed parents to be. Even though parents are not God, he put you in that place to be his representatives on earth. So you you provide for them, you support them, you take care of them, you love them. And I love using you guys as examples to your kids of, yes, although parents make mistakes because we're not God, you are the example. And, and over and over in scripture, this is what you see. Mm-hmm. God uses parents as examples of what his love, he calls himself father. Mm-hmm. You have that language of the mother, right? Uh, that, that permeates scripture as well, how he takes care of us. So there's that picture for us too. What do you guys take away from this chapter and this conversation about parents being the number one support? I think about um, all spiritual war- warfare, you know, and yes, that can be terrifying in some ways that, you know, we're on a, we're on a battlefield and there are um, forces at work fighting against us and fighting against our kids. But there's some really important things to remember about that battlefield picture is that we are on 
the victory side of that battlefield. Jesus has won for us eternal life and he has forgiven us all of our sins and he's forgiven our children and through baptism he claims them. All of these wonderful promises equip us to look at our kids not as the enemy, <laughs> but <laughs> as one who is under attack just like we are. And so when I'm weak, my kids, you know, I recognize that they have weaknesses too. When I'm under attack, I recognize my kids can be under attack as well. And so it can just shift my perspective that, hey, those kids belong to the Lord and there are enemies coming after them and I am a first line of defense for them. Um, there's a lot of pressure there and that can be kind of scary at times, but on the flip side, you recognize that your commander is victorious. And so when he equips you to help your fellow um, saint, that little kid, whether they're six or 16 or 36, um, that child, you know, the commander God, he is watching over you and he's allowing you to support them as fellow soldiers of Christ. And I think that's a, a very powerful thing. It's very hope filled. Um, yeah, I can't think of a better metaphor for life than the, that battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely hope in it. Yeah. Um, they're always watching, right? So I have um, a child that does not want to always hear the things that I have to say and will frequently argue with me about what I'm saying and try to find, you know, some kind of counter argument. I keep saying she's one day going to be either a mastermind criminal who ends up in prison or she's going to be working for the FBI catching the mastermind <laughs> criminals. God's got a plan for her. Um, but she's always watching, right? And when we talk about sticky faith, it's funny because she is in this ugly little place right now where she's questioning everything and questioning her faith and questioning God. But then things happen like VBS, where she's like, nope, got to go help. I mean, she wants nothing to do with church, but she's going to come help at VBS. And you've got to sing yes for VBS, or you are ruining these three-year-olds' <laughs> lives. I mean, they've got to do this. And you see her worshiping and, you know, praising God with these three-year-olds, and you're like, okay, yeah, God still got her. Mm -hmm. God still got her, even in the midst of everything going on. And she's always watching. She's watching to see how are we going to react to her? How are we going to talk to her? And I have to keep going back to, okay, Jesus came for the people that are lost. He did not come for the people that know everything. He didn't mm -hmm. come for the people that are mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're right. You know, the yes people. Yeah. He came for the people that are questioning. He came for the people that are searching. And that's why he gives us our kiddos, our own children. And then like Keith, you know, having been a teacher and all the other kids that are your kids. Absolutely. I mean, because once they're in your life, they're yours too. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that he, you know, puts in our paths for a reason. And Keith, what stands out to you when you think about parents being the number one support, right? That was what the research shows. Uh, how, does, how does that make you feel? How have you seen that be true uh, in your life? Well, I, I just try to get relational with uh, everyone and one of the things I relate to in this is the story of the prodigal son. And, you know, which one are you? Have, have you been a prodigal son in your life? Have, did you stray away? Were mm -hmm. you always the good, the good kid? You know, now you may be the parent. And, you know, one of the things that in today's terminology you would say about the parent and in, in the father and the prodigal son is he was an enabler. He mm -hmm. enabled his son to go out <laughs> into the world and do all this crazy <laughs> stuff. And the other thing that that story really doesn't tell us is a time frame. Did, mm -hmm. Was he gone a week, two right, weeks, 10 right. years? We don't know. We just know that if you raise up a child right, that they won't depart from it. And, you know, going back to Proverbs 22, 6, and that's kind of the theme of that. But, you know, we're all in different, you know, being older and being the father in the, I, I know I love my kids regardless of what they do. But, mm -hmm. but I also know they're not my kids as much as they are God's children. They all been redeemed with the waters of baptism, and I know that God God has a purpose for them, and my role is always going to be there, but it's going to change, and I can't always dictate what they're going to be, what they're going to do, what they're going to say, how they're going to react. But being a prodigal son at one time in my own life, uh, I know the joy a father would feel when his his son would come home or mm -hmm. having a good son, and again. You know, if you're the if you were always the good son, it may be hard to raise a prodigal son. That's you know, true. Yeah, no, it's, hard, it's hard to relate to that unless you do all of them, and it's hard to put yourself in in places like that because you know, you know, if I wasn't, I'm not going to sit here and say that, even though <laughs> I'm on 
uh, film it. I wasn't perfect. <laughs> you know, back a while, a while ago, you talked about sex, drugs, and alcohol. When I grew up in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Oh, there you Rock go. and roll because, but I also grew up when drinking was legal at 18. So you could, you know, a lot of us could, you know, legally drink. And, you know, that's something we don't even talk about, haven't talked about, is the legality and the, mm. the, the ethics of breaking the law. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you got to be deep into your college career before you can even legally take a drink. But that doesn't seem to stop people. It doesn't. So there's another layer of that. And, um, you know, so, so we're all, we all have our temptations. We all have our, you know, are we ready to have a prodigal son? Are we ready to have one return? What will we do? Will, will, we, will we be as forgiving? Are we always ready to show grace and mercy that God's shown us? I love you know? it. I really appreciate you bringing the prodigal son in because, again, especially as parents, as people that walk alongside of students or kids, whatever age that might be, whatever relationship that might be for you. And I love where you end it there of the grace of the father. The father doesn't say, I can't believe you did that. Uh, the father doesn't try and hide what his, what his son did. My son was dead. He's alive now. And then I also appreciate, though, too, like— uh, cause I would imagine most people like that have been in church their whole lives can call themselves what you call the good son, right. <laughs> like especially recently diving into the, the Luke 15 with the, the parable of the prodigal, uh, there's no such thing as a good son. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the second son is absolutely rude and dismissive of his father at the very end. And the father still comes to him. Right. Yeah. I, I like to call that the, the parable of the inviting father. Right. He's inviting the one son to come home and he's inviting the second son to come inside. And that is huge for all of us to, to, to think about as we walk alongside of kids and parents is that are you inviting with the grace and the love that God has invited you uh, back into his story too? Right. Yeah. Right. I love what you said about the, the the father's inviting and he's not afraid to acknowledge what his son did. You know, he runs you know, out the gates, to, you know, and exactly. he, he makes a fool of himself in the eyes of other people to welcome his son home. And I think it's really important for us never to feel ashamed or, or overly frightened about what our kids are doing when they are wrestling. Because honestly, the wrestle is a natural part of life. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be um, intentional or that we shouldn't, you know, approach it as, as though it is a serious thing. But God doesn't fear our wrestling with him. And in fact, I remember some very serious wrestlings that I did with the faith and my mom was terrified for me. I think, I don't think she would have believed that I would have grown up to be a theology teacher (laughs) because of, of just raw emotion that you have as, as an adolescent and, and, you know, your lack of understanding and pushback. Um, and so the wrestling isn't something that we need to be terrified of and should never be ashamed of when our kids are walking through it. But we certainly bring it to the Father every single day, knowing Mm -hmm. that He's going to invite them inside and back home every time. And we'll do the same. Yeah. And I love too, as the as the chapter kind of closed, how how it reminded us that it is never too late. Mm-hmm. Right. So some of the parents are going, My kids lost. They've been lost for years. <laughs> it's never happened. Like it was never too late. We don't have the time frame of the prodigal, probably for good reason. Mm-hmm. But it's also never too early, right? Yeah. To 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 be that for your kids too, to start modeling and being intentional. And I'll go back to that illustration of the hand, right? Parents, I want you to to see what's in your hand right now. You have in your hand what you can control. You can control your words. uh, You Mm. can control your actions, all right? You can control how you live and display your faith. And you can take baby steps to do that, to open up that Bible at home, uh, to make it to church on weekends, to be in that community that we've talked about, uh, to pray as a family or to pray as a couple or to pray just as a parent and to be caught doing it, right? You can't What's not in your hand is sex and drugs and alcohol and your kids' social medias to an extent, right? Or the things that they're going to stumble on and all the different life experiences. But I also want to think about God's hand, right? And he's got you mm-hmm. and he's got your, your child too. And that's huge for us as we walk together with things. And that's why we can be honest and we can be open about what's going on and not be judgmental. We'll hurt, right? There's no doubt God's heart hurts in the same way that the the prodigal's father, his heart hurt for his kid. That's why he went running because he was so glad that he was back. There's no doubt that our hearts hurt, um, but let's not go and then hurt, Mm -hmm. right? As a response to our hearts hurting, let's love, let's embrace any final thoughts with that? I mean, I think too, the, the end of the chapter too, where it really did end like on the final pages of 28, 29 was about ultimately that's where they landed too with that silver bullet conversation. Yeah. Ultimately, the one thing also we can put in that hand 
is praying Mm -hmm. for our kids and praying for our students, praying for the kids in our lives and trusting God with them. Ultimately doing what's the ultimate call of a believer and trusting in God above all things. Yeah, I think remembering that um, God is ultimately in charge, right? We're, we're, it's his, it's his game. (laughs) We're players in his game and he is in charge of us. He's got our kids in his hand and he's watching over them and he's loving them. And there's grace for us too, as parents. I mean, (laughs) because it's easy to look and go, oh my goodness, I really suck at this. Mm -hmm. But God loves us anyway. Exactly. And you know what? God still chose us to be the parent of those kids. Yeah. And he's got a plan and he's watching out for us and he's helping us. And we're not alone as parents either. So remembering that, yeah, there's grace for our kids when they step away from the faith, but there's grace for us too. Amen. Which is a mom. Oh, good grief. Thank you, God. (laughs) Adopting from foster care. You know, you've got the trainings and the licensing and you've got people who are checking up on you weekly and drop in visits and making sure everything's in order. You do, you start to feel a lot of pressure. Like, am I good enough? And you know, these, these aren't my kids biologically. And so I have almost an added responsibility to make sure that I'm doing everything possible to be the best parent that I can be. And then you think about that and you're like, well, my biological kids aren't my kids either. They're God's kids. Mm. And I, I am responsible to them. The fear can become overwhelming until you remember I'm God's kid too. I'm God's kid too. And he fiercely loves and protects me. And he's fiercely going to love and protect my kids. The forgiveness that he has for my kids is the forgiveness that he has for me. Oh, that just is a constantly needed reminder for my very sinful heart. <laughs> <laughs> And what I hear in this conversation is this pressure of parents yeah. to be a good parent. Mm-hmm. And I think this chapter, especially as it closes, challenges us to recognize what that means. And it really just means being a, a, a normal Christian. <laughs> is, that, is that a way to put it? <laughs> to, to, to live your faith, to not be afraid of your faith, to grow as a disciple, for you to chase after sticky faith mm-hmm. is going to be the most important step that you have to make it both internal and external, to make it personal and communal, to make sure it's mature and maturing too, that you're growing in faith and that it's not just something that happens on four, in between four walls on a Sunday, but it carries out. And that's kind of the not so sticky faith reality of (laughs) chapter one. Uh, But we will get into chapter two, the sticky gospel on our next episode. Thank you guys so much uh, for listening to us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you continue to enjoy walking through these resources uh, and and these conversations. I love you guys sharing each one of your experiences. Uh, It's been an absolute joy for me. And I hope it's been an absolute joy for our listeners. Thank you for joining us. (music) 